You're listening to All Things 3D, where we talk about the world of fabricating, designing, and capturing in the third dimension. Hey, everybody. It's All Things 3D right here. Whoa, we're looking at Magic Leap. We've got a really exciting show today. Today is February 5th, 2016, and it's Week in Review with All Things 3D. Here we're looking at, uh, looks like Magic Leap. We've got... Uh, We've got lots to look forward to today. We've got a special guest coming to us, uh, uh, Gabriel from uh, New Pro 3D, which is a new uh, SLA type printer, claiming to be the fastest printer in the world. And uh, got lots to talk about. Wow! Look at this. So what is that, Mike? Well, Chris, uh, as you can see, this is an earlier demo done by, uh, you know, that company called Magic Leap that just so happened to have, what, another 700 million um, in Alibaba, Alibaba, Alibaba on, its, uh, on its team now. So I guess it's Team Google, Team Alibaba, and Magic Leap. I, I don't know, something like wow. that. And what is this? This is a game that you can actually steer with your hands? Um, well, actually, one of the reasons that I brought it up, and maybe I'll pause it right now, uh, is this is one of the, they've only have two videos, and this is one of two, and I'm going to go through the whole process. This is looking through uh, either a headset of some sort. Um, yeah, there was an MIT article uh, called Technology Review, which is a magazine that goes through and, and talks about a lot of the technology that I'll bring up in a little bit. But essentially, this is a view through it. Now, if you notice, this looks a lot like what we've been seeing from Microsoft with their HoloLens. And I've noticed that the HoloLens came on the what do you call it, on the scene with a big hoopla last year, um, about at the same time that this was making an entry. So I think Microsoft knew that if this thing really moves forward, uh, HoloLens might be somewhat outdated. And there's some other, some other interesting things that I'm going to bring up a little bit later uh, that I think I, our audience will find very interesting uh, about Microsoft and uh, Magic Leap. And that is a patent uh, technology that seems to be shared by the two of them. So that's kind of interesting. But this seems to be viewed directly to it. Now what's interesting is that if you've noticed as we we're going through this video, everything is projected in a plane in front. Notice there's no occlusions. Everything has been set up. If you notice, there were the, these weapons here. Everything is projected in front of an object there. And, oh, so this is augmented underlying. reality. This is like uh, you're. This is not a game that you're actually playing on the screen. This is like a game that you're playing in a room that actually exists in your house or your office. Well, in, in this case, I think this was completely scripted. Um, these were all laid out specific to the But this the is graphic. the idea. Uh, but it was a concept to show what is the potential of Magic Leap. And as you can see here, things are in the space. The guy points his fingers at things. But if you notice, some of the movements seemed all scripted. Like when he moves his hand, it doesn't quite move at the same rate. Sure, so, it's conceptual rather than actual right. functional. Now, a little bit later, I'm going to show the, the latest video, but notice they're all, they're, what would you call it, a little bit uh, ghosted or, or maybe even uh, a little bit uh, shaded as though it's a visor or some type of sunglass. Or, so, and also in this case, you see some aberrations on the edges. Notice there's some red and blue fringing. So that tells me that there's some type of spherical lens that this thing is being viewed through. And that's extremely important, the term spherical, because that plays a huge role in what makes this different than the HoloLens. And we'll get into that in a moment. So on that note, I'm going to jump to my cell. Hi, everyone. And then right into uh, my desktop capture, which will show a few things that you can go out. And these will all be in the show notes, so if you want to do your own perusing. Um, this is a new patent uh, that identifies what the headset's going to look at and I have some images later on that I'll show off a little bit more but more importantly the the article that helped me move through and find the information is one and what's interesting is that uh, 
the name, I, well, there's an advertisement there, but uh, the name of the individual who wrote this was also the same person that wrote the article uh, with occipital behind, you know, NeoDVR and the EAVR uh, that we showed up at AWS. So I liked her article. She was very thorough, and she seemed to be very thorough in this one. Her name is Rachel Metz. So if you want to read a great article with some good links, uh, you're going to have to do a little more digging if you actually want uh, the patents. Uh, but very interesting article, and it talks about her reaction, the, the equipment, what she saw, and her opinion of where this is going. And she also talks about Abovitz, who is the CEO, uh, kind of the founder, and actually is a co-inventor in some of the patents that I'll show you in a moment. But uh, he dressed up as an astronaut in a TEDx that he did in one location, and with some it kind of looked like a scene from 2001, I guess, was the thing. So I guess the message was fudge. You know, I still haven't figured out what that is. So if somebody in the audience knows, you know, chime in. Uh, I'm still looking for it. Uh, one of the things I'll have in the show notes is there's a, a great little Reddit thread about them talking about it. Uh, and as you know, Reddit, there's a lot of smart people out there. Uh, so if you want to find out more information, that's a cool place to go as well. So I'm not going to spend any more time with this article. And I'm going to move into, let's see, uh, I'll leave this to last because that's going to be the most interesting thing. But I'm going to go right into the actual patent. So I'll start at the beginning. Okay. Hmm. All right, here we go. So, you know, you can read the abstract, but essentially what it talks about is using waveguides. And if you don't know what waveguides are, um, I have some experience with them because I was in the military and I worked in RF. But our waveguards were used a lot uh, in order to tune a particular uh, RF frequency. Uh, and they were mechanical, meaning they were like literally tubes, uh, waveguides, and they were specific to a particular frequency. So when I thought of that, what is he trying to do here? So here's an illustration that shows a layer, and he says it's multiple layers, but you have an input fiber, or an input cone that it, uh, transmits light into a coupling tube that goes through these waveguides, and these waveguides are sandwiched together, and then there are curved microreflectors that reflect this um, light back to you. So what you can do is literally use this coupling tube and this to create a multi-layered system. And again, remember, this is only one layer, and these are your sandwiches right here. Um, imagine that's like the, the depth information, and then you have multiple layers uh, to provide the X and Y. Now, that's the important thing, the depth. Now, Take, for example, I'm going to jump back to my screen. I'm going to pull, and since we're on a camera, we can't see it, but I'll take my little mini wife here. And if I move her around in space, back and forth, our eyes have a tendency to focus directly on this. Now, I'm on a camera, but if you look away from yourself, maybe behind you, you'll notice that there's a bunch of objects, especially in in my room and in Chris's. And if you focus on it, notice that uh, because of our fovea, we're able to concentrate on a particular object. Now, what makes this different than VR or AR is that normally you overlay a two-dimensional object on a single plane. Well, and as we talked about last week, these single planes make it very difficult for us to focus because it's just that. It's a single plane. Where in 3D or in reality, we have multiple planes so that we can determine. So one of the things that's in this patent is that you can have multiple layers that are bunched up behind each other and uh, create this impression of depth. And one of the things says it can be up to like 32. But the other thing he mentioned is that they don't have to be linear. I mean, sandwich one after the other. Or the distance don't have to be linear. So you actually can have more distance in the depth information as you get further out, which kind of makes sense because our eyes don't have the, the, the discernment that's necessary as you go even higher. So um, with that being said, that I think is the cool thing, and I'll jump back to the patent behind this. Now, so again, think of it as a sandwich, a three-dimensional display where you have an XYZ um, 
addressing system. So, with that being said, with with this kind of technology, how are you going to pull that up? I mean, it's extremely complex. They're going to be very, very tiny. And then it dawned on me, if you've been to any IMAX digital um, showing, either like a three-dimensional movie or a 3D or a stereo movie, what is driving that? It's a technology called DLP. Uh, and if you've heard about that, essentially the technology behind that is a bunch of really, really tiny mirrors, thousands of them, actually Mechanical, millions. Mechanical, right? Exactly. It's an electromechanical process. So we've already done this. This was created in 1987. So I don't know if that had any influence on what's being done here, but this uses something similar that either it, it may not be an electromechanical, but it may be some type of chemical process that causes us to bend the light and uh, actually cause these particular layers to uh, enable. And as you could see in that previous video, it, the concept seems to work. So here's the other important thing. Instead of just projecting uh, this XYZ matrix onto a static plane, what if we computed the actual curvature and then projected it onto a spherical mirror into your eye? So what does that do? Well, that actually will match the shape more of the cornea and uh, provide us what we normally see because, it, you know, one of the things that they've noticed is that since our, we have a lens, that has its own, what would you call it, distortion. It's not a flat plane. So this is the key difference, I think, between the Magic Leap and the Microsoft HoloLens. And that will allow me to jump. So obviously, I'm not going very far into this. There's a ton of stuff explaining this. The problem with patents is there's a lot of illustrations, a lot of numbers, and it's nice to have multiple screens or actually have paper, which I didn't print this out. I think I will. That allows you to reference all the numbers here. So I had to go back and forth. I actually had two screens up doing this. And um, it really makes a lot of sense if you really think about it. The problem, and as I've discussed already, is a complexity. Imagine a lot of things at the micro level that have to move in unison and it's a very complex process. But the cool thing is because we've made it uh, a mechanical process, the actual calculations can be minimized. If you remember what we talked about last week, Chris, where we had the two LCD planes and then we had to project images, all the computation had to be created for each of those planes. Here, all we're doing is a simple... Um, spherical calculations. We're, we're taking a Cartesian XYZ and then creating a polar coordinate from that and, so, and distorting it based upon that spherical mirror. A lot easier to do because everything else is done in the XYZ, um, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, matrix? Um, so think of it like that. Now obviously to do something like that, I'm envisioning this like cube in front of me, but it's probably a very, very thin with a bunch of layers. So let me jump to some images. This very is something interesting. That I found. Very interesting. Yeah. So this is what I found on the web. And, you know, I don't know. Some people are saying that uh, this was the early concept of it. I don't know for sure. <laughs> uh, just kidding. Um, if you saw Brainstorm, you'll know what I'm talking about. But it's what's funny is that she makes a comment, the individual who wrote that article that we had just talked about, um, that it reminded her of Brainstorm, so I thought I'd bring this up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the reality here is actually what some people think it looks like, and there may be some distortion here. <laughs> so as you see, <laughs> not too far off. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I think I think we're getting a little bit more polished nowadays. If you look at like the, you know, industrial design of the Oculus and the Avagant and all, and the Hololens, even the Hololens is still pretty bulky in the concept uh, stuff that they've been putting out. I think they're going to have to slim it down to get consumer adoption. That's well, my opinion. And, and speaking of that, I'll jump I don't right think in. it's going to be quite a long time. <laughs> hey, I don't it's have a problem goofy. wearing a helmet. Uh, <laughs> but if you remember that, uh, now remember, not, Brainstorm was made, I don't know, gosh, late 70s, if I remember correctly, early 80s. And I think it's really cool. My time. I think I'm going to bring it back up just because I think it's, it's fun. 
But first they started out with this big head thing, and then yeah. I don't have an image of it, and then it went into this nice little polished product, just like what we would do now. And I'm, this is probably one of the reasons I enjoyed this movie so so much is that it, it was not obviously that I didn't like the ending as much, but it was very realistic in its taking lab, big bulky things, and then streamlining them uh, to create a product. And if you remember Brainstormers where they were able to actually record the brain waves and then play them back in another individual. Uh, Kind of, I would say that's what we're doing now. But uh, going back to this, so early concept, but this is what it's supposed to look like when we get done. Right, and this is what right, the right, right. Notice polished. You got it in, but uh, in order to keep it slim, notice they have a little, as they call it, a little battery pack, or which. Oh, sure, sure, not, sure. But I'm not opposed to that. And the no, reason I'm not opposed to am I. I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to anything. Uh, <laughs> I think it goes back to the don't knock it till you try it type thing. And the battery technology is just also, ex I mean, it's it's exploding right now. I mean, just the same thing, same way that augmented reality and VR is, is exploding, we're seeing battery technology have a lot of leaps that's taking off right well, now, I, especially you know, in the actually, research field. I mean, maybe well, exactly. not. Exactly. Yeah, well, they not, realized, and, and the right. problem is because it's a chemical process, you don't have those uh, geometric progressions that you do with other types of technologies. And yes, there needs to be another leap in for it to become uh, good enough or provide the capacity for us to miniaturize or provide it. So I don't have an issue with that. And even though Microsoft seems to be pushing everything into a headset, I think, as we'll talk about in a little bit, that has been a problem for them. Uh, and I like the idea of a slim uh, device on your head and then an external battery pack slash computer or whatever uh, on your hip. I mean, how many years did we run around with a, uh iPod with earbuds huh? or the Walkman? So, I mean, that is not something new to us. Maybe it's kind of nerdy and we can't put it in our pocket, but even a phone, you know, we put it in our pocket. We put it under belt, well, geeks like I do. So if I'm going to leave it uh, with this and then go to the last patent and then segue into the Microsoft commercial. There's a reason I'm bringing it up. So here is, again, another illustration. I don't know if this is projected, but essentially this is the illusion given that an object is portrayed in space. And then... I'm going to go back to, well, I'll, I'll show it a little bit, uh, right now, where did it go? Hmm. Uh, well, it seems like I lost it, but, uh, oh no, I actually it's right here. So I'm going to go back to the, and we've actually showed this in a previous episode, but I want to bring it up again. Now that I have some new insight on what's going on, this is extremely important. Now, again, this is through, and as I say below, this is actually through the lens itself. Now, notice the important thing that they're showing there. It's occluded, meaning real-world objects overlay the, uh, what do you call it? they don't want to call it augmented. They're calling it mixed reality now. But the important thing to look at in this galaxy, notice that he is focusing on different objects. Now, that wasn't taken away before. Notice how he focuses on the Earth. Notice that he blurs. So he's actually varying what we were just talking about, that matrix of different layers in order to give the illusion of what he's focusing on. But also notice that as he looks away, or, or if you look at the sides, he's able to actually cause the focus to change on the edges as well. And that's extremely important. So he doesn't necessarily have to look directly at it. He can control the whole scene there. So rather so, than tracking eye movement, it just depends on which plane you're actually looking at. That's what people are saying. And if that's the case, um, God, some of these, I'm sorry, I get these links where some of them just constantly barrage you with audio. <laughs> uh, these little videos, I have to keep I know, up. I can't. But, um, so, yes, that's what I keep reading, too, is that they don't necessarily have to do eye tracking or very limited eye tracking because a lot of it is already done within this matrix. So, um, and that may help, too. So, after reading all this, 
I can understand why people have been wild and impressed and people are throwing money at it because if they can throw enough money at it, which I think is the important thing, um, they can miniaturize this and make this into a state of art product. Now remember, go back to the DLP. Who thought a bunch of little tiny millions of mirrors would be driving an IMAX film? So if you can think of that, I think this is going to work and very cool. So I'm going to segue into the Microsoft Super Bowl and I thought about this if obviously Microsoft is doing this and a lot of what magically verbiage sounds like is an Apple product <laughs> I'm wondering if this is the year that we're going to see another stunning advertisement for a stunning product and Magic Leap will be that I don't know but uh, this has already come out Right, <laughs> Super Bowl this weekend? Uh, I don't know. I'm not I in the loop. Gabriel, are you into American football? No. Uh, <laughs> can't say I. Uh, so We're trenched in this world, so. So here they're showing the HoloLens and how it can be applied to it. Oh, got it. it. Okay. Now, again, the issue I have with it is they portray these scenes from outside, third person, of these huge images. But the reality is, and you'll catch some glimpse of it, when they're actually like this thing coming out of the wall. <laughs> See the similarity between Magic Leap and all just, that? Yeah, they're just, they're just riffing, you know, they're just going for, they're just conceptualizing, brainstorming, coming up with whatever they can. You know, Microsoft just uh, posted their earnings, I think it was, what it was at 1.2 or 1.3 billion in 2015 on their Surface line. So yep. they're doing really well with these new devices that they're coming out with and, you know, it's gr I think it's great because Microsoft is back to innovating, back to making products that are kind of changing uh, the way we do things and interacting. Um, so I'm really actually looking forward to the HoloLens. I don't think I'll be watching football, but I'm not going to be watching football <laughs> anyways. Well, obviously it's very interesting. This is what's going to be um, their advertisement for the Super Bowl. But again, remember, Magic Leap just announced their uh, new, what do you want to call it, uh, infusion <clears throat> of millions of dollars. Alibaba is now on their team. Wow. Um, yes, Microsoft, I th it's like this huge battle. The battle of the titans, well, I Magic Leap, I don't even know is a titan, but obviously Microsoft is, is realizing that there's some conflict there. So I'm going to jump one more, and then we're going to close off this. If you remember, I mentioned that uh, I had seen something in my investigations to show that uh, a this process called planar waveguard, uh, waveguard, waveguide apparatus was shared by multiple inventors. Now, Roni Abovitz, I believe is his name, is the CEO of Magic Leap. However, look what's off to the side. What's in Seattle, Washington? Or Round Seattle, Washington, Bellevue, Washington, Redmond, Washington. Yeah, Microsoft. Microsoft. So notice that we have some shared, not necessarily technology, but at least ideas and patents between the two companies projecting upon using a planar waveguide. So obviously in Magic Leap's case, they, in my opinion, have made it much more sophisticated, which is why you have not seen any real tangible products. And as he's identified, we're not going to be showing it until it's ready. But who knows? We do have the Super Bowl coming up, and that is the time that people launch, I don't know, remember 1984 with the Macintosh? Probably the most prominent advertisement ever made during the Super Bowl. Could this be the year? Don't know. All right, I'm going to drop it off. We've talked about enough about Magic Leap. I think I'm tired of Magic Leap now. <laughs> and we're going to drop into our guest, Gabriel, who also has a stunning product. And we talked about it the other day. So I'm going to jump right into a video that uh, shows the process, and then we're going to have Gabriel kind of talk about it. So, Gabriel? Hey. Why don't you go ahead Welcome and introduce to the program, yourself? Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very excited to be here. Awesome. So, and you are from a company, what's the comp name of your company? 
the name of the company is New Pro. <clears throat> sorry, New Pro 3D. We're based out of Vancouver, Canada. Oh wow! Yeah, so we saw this. We covered this in the news uh, a few weeks ago. I guess maybe about a month ago. And uh, when we saw these videos, um, and uh, you're claiming that it's the fastest SLA on the market or fastest That's 3D right. printer yet, and uh, yeah, so what can you tell us about that? So we have been a research and development company for many years now. Over the last few years, we became very interested in 3D printing, and at the time, we developed a technique that would allow us to print to print 50% faster than the fastest printer at the time. Um, then Carbon 3D came out, and they shattered all speeds, right? Mm -hmm. And so it forced us, uh, it, it was a tough moment for us. It, it forced us to, to go back to the drawing board. It forced us to reassess the way we were doing things and perhaps think of a new approach. So we started analyzing a little bit more about this concept of having a dead zone when you print, right? And further analyzing this, we were able to come up with a brand new solution that allows us to print super fast, and that's what we have today. We now, can print continuously. Um, you, you don't actually directly identify yourself against Carbon 3D, but you, you look at other SLA processes. So how much, I mean, will you be willing to say on our show, how much faster is this than the Carbon 3D? You know, from the information that we have available today, we estimate that we're between 30 and 40 percent faster than them. Now, let's see, you know, I don't actually have the image in front of me, but one of the things, I do have your website, so let's see if there's actually some images. Uh, uh, here we go. Um, I'll bring this back up so that people can actually see what we talked about. So here we're talking about uh, the processes that we know of now, and then obviously yours. And I mean, it just kind of shatters the time frames. And yes. in the videos that you show, you can actually literally see the growing. Now, both Chris and I both have uh, Form 1. Actually, I have a Form 1. He has the new Form 2 from Form Labs. And yes, <laughs> it's like watching paint dry, maybe even worse than paint dry. Uh, I've had to do some time lapses to actually show the process. But those videos that we were watching, that's all done in real time, right? That's actually the progression of the bed. Uh, the, the, videos, the videos that you showed earlier are not shown in real time, no. The, the sphere, for example, the, the blue resin that you saw, the video that you showed, that takes about four, four minutes, 4.3 minutes to print. So it's, 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 yeah, it's sped up, but it's still a lot quicker. So yeah, I you think can watch this, a lot of the videos yeah. they actually have, the counter at the bottom, and that's in minutes. But I mean, I saw yeah. a sphere 100 millimeters across mm -hmm. get printed in about 10 minutes, which is that's right. exponentially faster than uh, the peel. Mechanism uh, oh, SLA that we have, yeah. So uh, that's right. So that that Eiffel Tower that you see on the website, I think it's about 14 centimeters, 15 centimeters, and we printed it in around 15 minutes. And it's not just a claim. We were at CES in Las Vegas, and we were showing this multiple times. We had thousands of people taking videos, looking at this. I mean, inches away from the machine, they saw for themselves that our claims are true, and uh, and and not just that, but the level of complexity that those shapes have, those objects have, and so we're, we're printing super fast with high accuracy. Amazing. Yeah. Well, and you know, one of the things that, uh, let me get into my questions here, is that uh, there was some controversy, and this is how I grabbed my attention, is that there was another company who either started a Indiegogo or a Kickstarter um, that you had to go out and actually say, hey, wait a minute here. You're kind of borrowing technology that really isn't yours. Is there a backstory behind that uh, that you care to talk about a little bit? What happened there? Yeah, so we, first of all, we love Kickstarter. We think crowdfunding is incredible. We support it. The thing is that what happens often is that people or a company or a group of people will ask for funds on something that doesn't necessarily belong to them. And I'm not the only person that thinks that. I mean, that's a big problem with, with Kickstarter and crowdfunding, right? So we don't understand how somebody can go ask for funds for something that they do not own. So there was a bit of tension there, and uh, we were lucky that we were able to react on time. 
and we said, hey guys, I, you don't necessarily own what you claim to own. And I don't want to go too much into it, but basically, um, it wasn't a bad thing. These things happen in business all the time. And what it, it turned out to be a good thing. It, it forced us to, to show the world what we had been working on. It forced us to tell everybody, hey, guys, look what we have. Right? This is ours. And so for that reason, I like to see it as a, as a good thing for us. And um, it's things that happen. Yeah, and and so so and obviously there you guys have uh, incredible amount of intellectual property, and you guys are is, is this patented technology now um, that you guys can talk about it, or mm -hmm. is this uh, you guys are waiting obviously until it goes to market before you you delve too much into exactly how it works. Um, yeah, yeah, we we've done. Um, We've done everything the, the right way. We've we filed for a patent. We have a provisional patent. Uh, I think under the new laws of patent, you are allowed 12 months of secrecy. So we we really don't like to get too much into it, but it. we're protected and we've done everything. We've we've proceeded in the right way. Well, you know, actually, one of my questions is, how does this damn thing work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so maybe we won't get. Uh, hear much. So we'll, we'll, we can make some guesses like I just did with mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Magic Leap in the future episode. But, uh, you know, essentially one of the things that we figured out with the Carbon um, 3D is that it used a, what, some type of uh, perforated membrane, uh, one that mm -hmm. is permeable to oxygen, and this is what helped the flow. And, mm -hmm. you know, you do show that you have an, a, an inhibited layer, a wettable membrane, so I'm thinking that probably something like this also is uh, being done here too. And then you show a light projector. Uh, so obviously a lot of intriguing functionality being built into this. Um, yeah. The form lab uses a laser. Uh, I don't know what's actually being used in the Carbon 3D. Uh, Chris, is it very similar to a DLP process, if I remember correctly? Sure. Uh, is this what you've got going on here as well? Um, so, ba I mean, basically, you're showing the website, and that's that. What's on the website is what I can share with you today, okay. and <clears throat> I can tell you that we don't. We have a very different approach than what some of the things that you listed before. We're not using oxygen, right, uh, or mm -hmm. gases, right, and we have like like it says right on your screen. We have a wettable, uh, transparent membrane that allows for a depth zone and within that, that, that membrane allows for, it inhibits polymerization between the printed object and the membrane and that allows us to print continuously. And uh, another thing is that a lot of the, uh, these similar approaches at printing, what they do is they have to uh, they print a layer, and then before they can print the next layer, there has to be a peeling effect, right? Sure. And so by using our membrane uh, and by uh, with the technology that we've developed, it allows us to not use that peeling process, and we're able to print continuously. Right? And by creating what's what you refer to as a dead zone. As a dead zone, yes. Right, where the where the material is not curing as it's being uh, basically exposed to light, there's a layer that's not being cured in between what we call normally we see as the vat and mm. the the um, rest of the model where it's attaching. So it's basically exposing an area, and in between the vat, the bottom of the vat and the model is a dead zone that's not that this wettable membrane prevents it from being cured, and that's what you refer to as a dead zone. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah, well, I think, yeah so, so and, and is, there, is there anything else that you would maybe uh, uh, say is unique or better in this printer besides the continuous ability to print? That's a very good question. I wanted to, to, to touch on that. So what our solution does is that it allows us theoretically, to print in any size, right? So we are con constantly pushing those boundaries about how big we can print. We can print very large areas. And so I'm not going to throw out any numbers right now, but we'll, we'll probably make announcements fairly soon on that, on, uh, on different sizes that we can print. So when you look at the 3D printing industry, what are, what are two big hurdles that, that we need to cross? One is, is the time it takes to print, and one is the size that it takes to print, right? 
most of the machines they look at they're fairly small. So w our solution, what it allows us to do is to cut the time and to to be able to print in very large sizes, right? So that's something again we're always working on, and uh, we'll probably have very interesting news to 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 share soon. Yeah, and one other, and we'll get right into the, the next question is availability. You know, one of the things you mentioned to me in our brief discussion, uh, Gabriel, is that uh, this you don't really know what direction you're going to go with this. Uh, you know, we didn't actually talk crowdfunding, but you know, is that a direction? Are you looking for external funding? Um, what are the plans for it? And I know that this early in the game, you probably don't have any pricing, but obviously, I'm going to ask. What are you hoping to, to, to sell this for? Well, you're right. We don't have a consumer-ready machine, and we haven't exactly decided when we would start doing something like that. There's still a few internal decisions that have to be made. But one thing that we've noticed is that there's, a, there's, a, there's been a switch in the industry where there's a, there's a, a big demand for mass production of 3D printed objects, right? So mass customization. And so that to us seems to be a bit more interesting than just creating machines to sell or small machines for everybody at home. I mean, that's also interesting, but one company cannot do it all, right? So we're, we're, we're very curious and very interested in doing mass production of 3D parts. And so that may be the direction that we may go so maybe targeting a different market than a typical, like the trying to compete one on one with Form Two or uh, or Form Labs and Carbon 3D, who are going into the mass market. You guys might be looking at more of like the factories that are looking at mass customization. Yeah, that that to us is very interesting, and uh, it's still mm -hmm. been beneficial to to everybody, right? Yeah. What we we would like you to see us as an R and D company for 3D printing. So another thing that's interesting to us is perhaps licensing our technology so that we can keep doing what we're really good at, and that's innovating, that's creating, fixing problems, constantly improving technology. That's what we're really good at, right? So that's another option that we're, we're looking into, licensing what we've created, and so we can keep focusing on the things that we're good at. And again, as soon as we have some news on, on what, exact, uh, what exactly our... Our decisions are uh, on that front. We'll let you guys know. Yeah, and in light of that question, one of the things that uh, I was going to ask you is uh, what will your policy be on resins? But if you're not actually going to make a commercial product, uh, that would lead me to the next question. What type of uh, resins can this thing support? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, companies like Formlabs have multiple uh, formulas depending on if you want a high strength uh, resin, if you want a what do you want to call it, a detail resin, or if you want an elastic resin, uh, are these things supported on with this printer as well? That's an excellent question. And the thing is that as long as the resin is photoreactive, we can print it, and we can print it faster than anybody else. So the resins that we use are resins that anybody can buy. They're not particular to our machine, right? So each resin will dictate the physical properties that you have. That, that, that depends largely on the resin that you use. So we are working with some new resins, but not because we have to, but because we're curious, right? We want to see what some new resins can do and developing always something like that on the side. But whoever uses our machine is able to use any resin that's photoreactive that exists in the market, and that'll dictate the physical properties. So we can have things that are rubber-like, we can have things that are really hard, we can have things in different colors. There's, there's a lot of options there, as you already know, because there's a lot of options in resins. Well, that's good to hear. So, Chris, uh, I'll leave you with the, the, the final question, and then uh, we'll go from there. But, uh, you know, Gabriel, Gabriel, it was fantastic. I know this was, uh, I wouldn't say last-minute thing, but we almost didn't make this happen. Almost didn't I, make it. My, the questions were sitting in my outbox, so I apologize. So I'm glad that you were able to come on. And, uh, Chris, do you have uh, any more questions? Um, yeah, well, I'm just interested to know, uh, as far as slicing software, you know, obviously we have, uh, we've had, Steve has been, and I get from Creation Workshop, has been a guest on our uh, show many times, and uh, uh, we definitely are always interested in the software that are, uh, that, that you people are using out there. Are you using an off-the-shelf solution, or did you have to write your own uh, slicing mm -hmm. software? 
Um, we we um, a bit of both, I suppose. We 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 have um, created something that is our own, but if we decide to produce something for mass market for consumer use, that would be open source. So you would create your own open source uh, uh, software. Yes. Amazing! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so that other people can. Uh, uh, Embed it within their own applications. I'm assuming, or add on to it. Uh, well, I'm I, um, not really the person to answer that right now, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to jump to my screen here. Yeah, if anybody is interested uh, in our audience or who is going to be watching this later, uh, you have a nice contact switch, uh, switch <laughs> page that identifies, uh, you know, how to get a you know, hold of them. They have some email addresses, which believe it or not, is a good thing. Not everybody does that. Or you email them and it comes back rejected, which is strange. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and then you have, uh, you're in Vancouver, Canada. So yes. that's also interesting. We've actually had several people on from Canada. Uh, from the 3D perspective, there seems to be a lot of talent up there. There is, in, yes. Uh, about the U.S. border. I hope yeah. <laughs> this isn't a border that we get walled off. Well, just kidding. Um, so, Anything else, Chris? And uh, I guess we'll just move on with the show. No, Gabriel, okay. really appreciate you coming on the program, and uh, we definitely want to stay in the loop. So how do we stay informed? Well, we'll make an announcement fairly soon. Uh, in the meantime, you can contact us, and someone will reply shortly. And uh, we'll constantly be adding more information to our website as we have new developments that we can share. You guys have an email blast list that we can get on? Yes, we're actually going to add a newsletter uh, sign-up form on the website in the next couple of days because we keep getting tons of emails. So we're going to do that, and we're, we're going to create we're creating a newsletter right now so that people can stay informed with the things that we're working on. And thank you so much for, for having us, guys. We, we love sh we're very proud of what we've created, and we love sharing it and talking with smart people like you and sharing what we've done. So thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you, Gabriel. And Mike. Best of luck. Mike. Sorry, Chris. No, go ahead. So I was just saying that my jaw dropped when I saw this, so I'm glad that they took some time to be with us. Okay, mm, well, we've got tons of All other right. things to talk about. I'll uh, say goodbye. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Gabriel. Thank you. Bye-bye. So on that note, let's jump right into the news items. Not that these weren't great news items already. <laughs> but uh, Sure. Let's see. Where are we at? Uh, I think we're in 3D in design, architecture, and engineering. Oh, and I, and Lots I of stuff. There was so much stuff this week that happened that I don't even know how we're going to cover it all. So, I don't know. We'll do it really quick. So I'll okay. start with the Dassault system. You know, Chris, we know that you're a big fan of uh, SolidWorks. You use that on a day-to-day -day basis. You make some money using that product. Yeah, and now, SolidWorks imagine. World happening this week. It, it happened. It's uh, it, I think today is the last day, or maybe yesterday was the last day of SolidWorks World. So at CES, uh, there was an announcement that DeSalt will be working with the HTC Vive. Sadly, you bought the other product, but <laughs> in working with them, they, they're wanting to replace their cave. And we I talked about caves uh, a few episodes, one that you weren't part of. And uh, essentially, a cave allows you to project on multiple surfaces a, an environment, and then you stand in that environment, and it creates the illusion that you're part of it. So what they're wanting to do, because caves can be expensive, because you have multi-projectors and you need space, is put on a headset, the Vive, and then be able to use with their hand devices the ability to actually move objects around and design in the 3D space. Uh, so I can see that being a very cool application. HTC, uh, excuse me, HTC Vive, you know, I'm, I'm mentioning HTC Vive, but there's also, uh, you know, somebody that doesn't get mentioned a lot, and that is Steam uh, or Valve that's behind that as well. And uh, <clears throat> what they had shown is the ability to paint or draw in 3D space, and there's some, some real cool videos out there uh, that maybe we'll show next time. In fact, I think I did show one of them. Very cool process, but now we can actually push it into uh, the CAD world, and uh, obviously DeSalt is a big leader in that area, so it'll be very fun to follow this. Uh, so that was an announcement. Uh, 
other than that, really nothing more to talk about. So moving into the next item, which I think is kind of cool, is creating VR. And Chris, you wanted to talk about this, right? Uh, which one are we looking at? Um, how Epic Unreal Engine is creating the ability to create VR within VR. Yeah, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll throw it on yeah. the screen. I can pull that up too. Oh, here, yeah, you've got it up. So uh, basically, Unreal previewed uh, on, via their Unreal Engine YouTube channel um, a preview, early preview of building VR in VR with Unreal Engine 4. And so here he is with the HTC Vive, and it shows. Uh, um, I can actually pull up the video on screen here, and basically showing moving around, editing objects, building like a game level. So actually designing the level from the ground up in VR. So you're experiencing the VR as you're building it. So it's obviously going to be, become more relevant to the, um, you know, the VR users because you're going to be experiencing the level while you're building it. So rather than building levels and not knowing how they're going to play out to a VR user, they're going to be built from the ground up in VR. Um, and obviously, this is an early beta preview. He's showing just moving and um, kind of transposing. And there's basically like an iPad-like interface inside. And he's using the little controllers and everything. So looks pretty cool. Um, yeah, and, and it's got uh, real-time lighting. Obviously, the Unreal Engine, the latest Unreal Engine 4 is just incredible. Uh, game development engine. Well, speaking of that, uh, I will have uh, a lot more to talk about a little bit later on how I have been using it and creating some stunning results uh, with my little hybrid unit, but we'll talk about that later. So yeah, I saw this and I said, wow, how cool, because I've been working with the Unreal Engine, gosh, over a decade back when it was Unreal uh, UDK2 uh, for a architectural firm uh, for some visualization and then uh, been working with Unity but recently working with the Unreal Engine again, because one, I kind of like the look of the Unreal Engine, but two, it's use with Gear VR, which is a Samsung product, um, is just kind of stunning. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But man, I, I don't know if this, I don't think this is available yet as a prototype or a beta, but man, I look forward to playing with this. But if it's HTC Vive only, there are some concerns on, on when this will be available, and even as a developer, and I signed up for it, who's actually going to get it? Um, but it is very cool. Um, I don't know. I want one. How about you, Chris? Well, you actually have something <laughs> else coming in, right? <laughs> yeah, I ordered the Oculus. I just, you know, it. it there's so much uh, firepower behind that now, and, and I, I think they've come a long way, and obviously being that I had one of the Dev1 units, and I've kind of experienced a few of the Dev units. <clears throat> Since then, I I just, you know, what, I, I mean, it's like PlayStation, Nintendo, Xbox. It's like <laughs> it's at the end the of the day, way. you kind of you end up with what you end up with. Sometimes you end up with more than you want. So I may, it may be one of those things where, oh, the Oculus is great for some things but then the HTC like you said integrates with SolidWorks maybe I want that for work or who knows I don't know we'll see I I, I really I'm, I'm jazzed about that Avigant glyph um, but I want to try one out before you know and, and got to save up for one of those but <laughs> I kind of already had the budget tucked aside for the oculus I kind of had already committed well, and yeah, said okay about, yeah we talked about it several times um, so, um, I did not move in that direction. So uh, I do want to I do want to talk about one thing in the three D uh, uh, printing realm um, real okay. quick and kind of take a, take a moment can and I, uh, can I talk about the Maker Shed real quick and then sure. it won't be and then uh, we can go. On. So one of the things that uh, and I'll bring it up is I had a few books sent to me um, because one of the people that we've had on our show on several occasions, uh, Jesse, it was a co-author of it, and so they sent me the books. So. You know, we we oops, almost got, we we talk yeah. a lot about about virtual, but you know nothing better than the actual tangible objects. So here we go. These are these are called book books. This, you know, they're paper. Yeah, yeah, they do exist. 
<laughs> and uh, so the one that I want to talk about, there's actually, I got three of them. One is 3D printing projects. So if you need some ideas, the other one is designing in 3D. But the one I want to talk a little bit about is this one uh, written by Jesse, who's the evangelist for uh, the one, two, three products, but it talks about how to use their application and it goes through the process of not just one, two, three D, but using their uh, mesh mixer product, using um, their, let's see, there's a couple of others in here. I guess if I went to the table of contacts, mesh mixer, one, two, three design, one, two, three D make, one, two, three D catch. Uh, and kind of shows you how to work with these and also one two three d skull plus which i thought was kind of cool um, that's the one that allows you to create characters and then you can print them out but you can also export them into a video game or something like that so if you if you want to get something for your kids or maybe yourself who wants to just get started in this uh great little book i highly recommend it for schools and that because uh, you know sometimes having an actual thing that you can hold in your hand and flip pages is cool. So I'm glad that we haven't gone completely away from this type of thing. I do think it's available in ebook format as well. So if you want to go in that direction, but a uh, little shout out to our friend, Jesse Harrington from Autodesk. Awesome. All right, Chris. Thank okay. you. So the, the reason I wanted to bring this one up and uh, kind of make a point for this show is because time is of the essence. A uh, new company came onto the market here on Kickstarter and launched this week. Porcelite, ceramic resin for SLA DLP 3D printing. Um, so you can watch the video here and kind of get a glimpse at what it is. It's basically a, an SLA resin that you cure and uh, it's just like any other resin. You just set your settings to cure it at their specified time. It works with, uh, obviously they show it with a Form Labs printer and it's a compo ceramic composite material. And then you put it in an oven or a kiln, I should say, at I think 2100 Fahrenheit and fire it. And you can glaze and fire it as well, or you can fire it and then glaze and refire it and then what you're left with is an actual porcelain model so wow. yeah so it's actually like a porcelain it's similar to what we saw a few a few weeks ago with the company in malibu here in california which i emailed and never got a response back from so uh not even sure if they're going to bring a consumer mo uh, product to market but these guys have officially beaten that company to market um, at least with a Kickstarter and sh given pricing. So for two, 215 bucks, you can get a liter of their uh, porcelain resin. And so I got on that bandwagon to test that out. Now, what uh, printers does it work with? I know I noticed that it says a uh, DLP type projector. Will it work with your form too? Yeah, no, they show. Yeah, it, it, it says it clearly that it works with the SLA and the DLP printers that have, obviously, you have to have the ability to change settings. So, so it's like, you know, if, if you have a printer that's closed source and that you can't um, put, they, they use proprietary resins, then you're not going to be able to, um, you know, probably print this very effectively, but. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the form, that's one of the great things about the form two and the form one plus and the form one that they've, that, that I really appreciated. And one of the reasons that I, uh, you know, invested in a form two was the fact that they're open to other resins than just resins they make. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. And that has been an issue with other companies. Um, so yes, having an open mind on that uh, and we in fact one of our earlier guests was from a company was it made solid uh, that created uh, resins that would work with their printer all right well let's move on to our scanner darkly and i only have one item i don't know if you have anything to add to this but essentially there's a guy or a company from russia uh, that has created a a turntable and here's a little video uh, that i'll show but uh, essentially, let me expand that. Um, it is like a scanning turntable. And that if you look really close, it looks like, uh, yeah, I'll jump right to, um, 
But if you look in the background there, it looks like a bunch of uh, Connect Ones <laughs> or even the uh, the uh, Prime Sense. See it there? Uh, and remember, I had a bunch of these. So a little interesting how he's going to keep obtaining those. But I like the actual turntable. Maybe he needs to get uh, in contact with a Cipital. Uh, but uh, I like that device. I mean, a turntable with... Uh, arms that move up and down to scan an entire person. Um, so that would be kind of cool and maybe a low cost way to create a kiosk. I know there are other companies doing it, but they want like $50,000. I can't see that being, you know, more than a few thousand dollars. So I think that would be pretty cool. Um, and that may have been a prototype. So I thought that was kind of neat. And I, I know that I have thought about that. I actually have some motorized turntables that I, and an arm that I create similar to that but it was all stationary. There, the actual object rotates around the person. And there is reasons that's being done, and I think that's really cool. Um, so that's it for Scanner Darkly, unless you had something. No, I, oh. yeah, I think <clears throat> I think we could move right on. Um, okay. Well, let's get into the VR corner and around room. And the first item I want to talk about is, uh, and it'll be available soon as a Kickstarter, if I remember correctly, it's called a stereoscopic webcam. And this goes right into another item that I read about. Uh, it's the one that keeps giving me that audio because it keeps running those little stupid videos in the side in my next tab. But uh, this actually is a webcam that, uh, and I asked him about it, it doesn't necessarily have a full, what do you want to call it, fish eye, but it does seem to have... 180 degree ultra wide angle lenses. It is two. Uh, the product, when it's finally available, uh, will have one USB 3 uh, driven uh, cable. And essentially, you hook it up like a webcam, except it provides a stereo imaging pair because of the two lenses, as you see there, and uh, will allow you either through their proprietary software or my next item coming up because uh, YouTube is going to be supporting 360 streaming, uh, the ability to do 360 streaming. So here he shows it basically used in a, a conference, but one of the people uh, that commented when he uh, identified this in one of the groups that I was in is that, well, it's not going to look like this because both of you are going to be wearing goggles <laughs> in order to see the 360. Uh, so that would look kind of funny. But I guess if one person or more importantly, if you wanted to put this on a tripod and utilize this uh, as an external source to, uh, uh, you know, maybe a third camera or put it in a live event, uh, this would give you the ability to at least do 180, and that's an important point. It only does 180, or in this case, 170 degrees in front of the person. Uh, it does not do anything behind you. And I played with some of the videos and some 360 viewers, <laughs> and you can spin around and see the same scene behind you, too. So that was kind of weird. Uh -huh. huh. But, uh, yeah, it was kind yeah, of but fun. I, but I imagine that this is just, uh, you know, like we've talked about, just an early, you know, iteration, right? Um, well, I think, well, obviously it's early, but I think this is actually what the product's going to look like. And uh, there will be a developer version. What did he say? I think it'll be about $300. And then when it's actually available in uh, later in the year, March is for the developer. Later in the year, the consumer version will be about $200. So it'll be reasonably priced. Uh, for doing something like that. I know the V360 that I have, which isn't stereo, it's just a single 360 camera, was uh, close to $400. The other product by Ricoh, uh, the Theta S that just came out, is also just a single camera, and that's above 300 So 200 for this little product might be cool if you want to get into streaming, which then leads me to my next item. Looks like YouTube is going to be providing soon 360-degree live video streaming. So guess what? We're going to be doing our show in 360. We'll yeah, I was talking. Cameras. I was I was talking to some some guys the other day about. I think this is the future of like going to sporting events or whatever. Instead of you know being courtside at the Lakers game, I mean they could have a couple of those little cameras like you just showed, like by the basket. And there could be a producer just like there is for a TV one, but <clears throat> instead of looking down and having the cameras jump all around, 
to follow the action, you could just be sitting courtside and look where you want and switch camera to camera on your own and, you know, hop around to different courtside seats. And, you know, I'm, I'm just envisioning like Oculus has a courtside seat, you know, dedicated to them and they stream out the Lakers games or yeah, whatever. The big banner in front of it. Uh, Crazy. So yeah, I think that's going to happen. Um, obviously YouTube, if they move forward with this, um, I think will be pretty cool and uh, we'll enjoy doing it. Uh, those of you who are watching live, we're down to two viewers now. Uh, this, uh, as you can tell, you can watch this while we're doing it, but it will also be archived immediately to YouTube. So I'm assuming the same case here is that you can watch it and then it's immediately archived. Uh, so yes, I do see that being a huge potential. Uh, what else was I going to mention on that? Uh, uh, oh, the Super Bowl supposedly is going to have some 360 cameras as well. Obviously, I don't believe it will be streaming, um, but it may have content later on uh, where the actual, you know, how they have those camera systems that drop down on cables. Supposedly, one of those will be a 360. So it'll be pretty interesting to see some of the, the aspects of that uh, at a later time because you'll be like right there. So that'll be very cool. So yes, I agree with you, Chris. All right. Well, on to the next item. Uh, there is, you know, one of the things I've been working with uh, the Unreal Engine, mm -hmm. and one of the issues that uh, I have is the only way that you can enjoy the Unreal Engine in at least mobile currently is with the uh, the plugin that works with the Gear VR, which is a Samsung product, which means you, you need a Samsung phone. And previously it was ex, ex, expensive VR headset, but now they have a $100 unit. And I have converted a $100 unit uh, initially uh, to work with my Note 4 and actually found the experience pretty good. So I can understand why there's been some attention with it. But the sad thing is if you don't have a Gear VR or let's say you have an iPhone, how can you create unreal content? Well, this guy has come up with a stereo uh, version that works with the the IMU. You now that this is specifically for Android, but uh, essentially allows you, and these are just demos, the ability to rotate your head around and create an unreal environment outside of the Gear VR. Now, he hasn't actually put out a plugin yet. Um, I'm requesting one because uh, I have some other uses for it. Um, but he does have some demos. So if you want to try this yourself, you can sideload them. Um, I've tried a couple. They work, but uh, their frame rate is a little lagging. And that will lead me into my actual Samsung a hybrid that I created in my opinion about that. He also has a rowing simulator, which I wasn't able to get working on either using either of these downloads. So I'll have to contact him on that. Uh, but he's making progress. So if you want an option to use the Unreal Engine, as we just talked about, they're coming out with tools that allow you to design VR within VR. Uh, this would be very cool. So I will report back on that in the future, but then I will push to my own camera and show off my little hybrid that I created over the weekend. Can you see that there? This I am calling the Neo DVR Loop Game Gear, or Gear Pad, sorry. Um, this is actually an Ipega Bluetooth Game Pad. I have taken all the guts out of the actual Samsung Gear VR headset and <laughs> mounted them to my loop why did i do that because the loop has amazing lenses uh, that allows you to literally look in uh, there's very little spherical distortion very little chromatic aberration uh, which i'll show you in a series of images here shortly but i found that the experience now is awesome and one of the things that i noticed with the gear vr because i have been testing it for an article that i'm writing is the gear vr actually performs quite well surprisingly well so one of the things that I've noticed that doesn't happen on my Google Cardboard is that it gets hot. So I have a feeling they bumped up the processor to the highest rate possible. They use an external IMU. And for those of you who don't know, that's the inertial measurement unit, if I remember correctly, um, that uh, essentially gives you all of your X, Y, Z, and rotational information uh, when you move your head and then relates that back into the VR experience. So it makes, gives you the ability to move around in the VR 
um, place, but they use an external IMU. And the reason for that is that one, they can sample it much faster than the built-in one in the phone, and it's more accurate. So that allows this what they call motion to photon functionality that's very important, meaning when you move your head, the screen should move with you. If it doesn't, it creates a lag <coughs> and disturbs that experience. And you know, if you have a back when they had the DK1 and even the DK2, if you had a low performing PC, you may have noticed that because things didn't follow you. In fact, the same thing can happen with uh, some of my more intense uh, Unity uh, demos that I've created. You move, but guess what? The image in front of you doesn't move at the same rate. So it can be somewhat lagging and disturbing and can create some motion sickness. So one of the things that is identified is that it, you have to push this to about 90 frames per second per eye in order to create that. And that's what the Oculus Rift has done with theirs. And which is why they've identified that you need a beefy machine uh, to push out the visuals at a rate that is comfortable. But then there's one other thing, and this gets back to the magic leap. You also need to be able to concentrate it at a place in space as though it were natural as looking at a 3D space. And that is something that still hasn't been accomplished by the Rift. And there are some tools, as we talked about last week with NVIDIA and the Stanford, that you can use multiple planes to simulate that. But ultimately, I think Magic Leap, if they ever get that off the ground as a consumer product, uh, will have the the end product or end goal there. So that's what I've been working on. Spent lots of hours playing a lot of different demos and I really felt very immersed with this. And I've got a few images that I put together that uh, I'll show of what it actually looked like inside. Now this is through the lens using a micro four thirds camera. Uh, through one of the lenses. So this is what I was actually seeing as I was moving around in this demo that I converted um, from the Unreal into a VR demo. And obviously nobody's done this before because when I put these up, a lot of people were very surprised. These are actually part of the Gear VR uh, menu system that I'm showing now. And then these are the actual stereo pair um, screen captured from the demo. So these will be in the show notes for a link. So if you want to try them in your Google Cardboard, this is what you're missing if you um, don't have a Gear VR. And yes, I do believe uh, what they've done with it is pretty important in the mobile world. And uh, I think that uh, I hope, well, they're not going to make it open source because obviously Samsung wants to sell more phones. Supposedly the S7 is going to have things specifically to support uh, VR, which will be coming out supposedly in April. And that will be the S7 as well as the S7 Edge. And uh, I see more things coming, which leads me to my final item. But I may not have had that up. Oh, which is, let's see, I've got a little video here somewhere. Well, maybe not, but it's not that important. But essentially, um, there is another product that's going to be released uh, at the Mobile World Conference uh, along the VR line, because I think Samsung found a niche for themselves again. And that is the Gear VR 360, or the Gear 360 or something like that. But that is a, a dual lens spherical camera, very similar, more than likely, to the, um, the Ricoh Theta S. Uh, that they'll be coming out with. One of the images that I wanted to show, let's see if I can bring it up because I think it's kind of cool. Well, they're they're showing it, but this really is not it. They actually have another product. Um, let's see if they show it in this. Yeah, here we go. This is really not, everybody keeps showing this, but this isn't the product they're going to be releasing. This is something that was part of their project beyond. And I think it's going to be a little too expensive for most people. This is a multi-thousand unit. They had talked about this last year and actually did some live streaming events with it. But essentially it's dual stereo cameras providing a full panoramic. Uh, we've seen this before, but as you can see, it's a fairly polished product. But this one is not cheap. They're supposedly coming out with basically a sphere 
with two fish eyes on both ends of it that you can put in a room and have full through 360 panoramic. Uh, no uh, talk about price yet, but it will be announced uh, later this month uh, when they announce the S7. So I think that's going to be pretty cool. And uh, I've watched a bunch of 360 videos and that really works really well on the, the Google Cardboard as well. So we'll see what happens there. Well, I think that's about it. Well, I guess that's all of my item. What does the Print Whisperer have to say this week? The Print Whisperer has been playing with his Form 2 and been very impressed with the quality of the prints. But one of the things that is kind of a pain in the ass is uh, the post-processing. So the support removal kind of leaves these little dimples on the outside. And there's a lot of hand, uh, hand uh, kind of sanding involved. And just it seems like a lot of post-print cleanup that isn't necessarily the same as FFF style printers. I mean, obviously you have post print, post, you, you know, support removal, same kind of thing, but it doesn't necessarily leave the same type of dimples and it's not as hard. It's not as noticeable because it's as clean of a print, right? So um, what I've been lately looking into is, um, and this came as a recommendation, not only from Stratasys, but by a bunch of people on the internet and even some of my clients recommending this to me is an abrasive blast cabinet. Um, so this is just an example of one. Um, and then uh, basically Stratasys uh, recommending a uh, plastic blasting media, uh, 1620 um, abrasive blast media to load into a blast cabinet like this. So this one, about $379 for a blast cabinet, you know, kind of a cheaper one. This is kind of a lower end kind of starter one. And, uh, you know, you obviously have to have a place to put this and then you need the right kind of media and uh, you need an air compressor to run it. Um, and, uh, yeah, but that should, uh, what I'm told is, um, because I haven't received mine yet, but, uh, you basically just do a couple passes over your part and it basically will smooth it out for you. So kind of similar to a rock tumbler or something like that, but more, um, just kind of quicker and, you won't necessarily break your part. You can still mask fragile air areas off and kind of control what's getting blasted and what's not versus some of the tumbler options that are out there. So this still can be uh, compatible with fragile parts. There's some other images. Can you kind of click on those too? Of course. Yeah, so this one's nice because it opens on the top. Um, and then there's obviously some uh, filtration uh, options. So they've got, they've got some like uh, air filtration reclaiming units that you can put on. Um, and then here's the gun. This is what the gun looks like. It's got a, basically a ceramic nozzle that is replaceable, um, after so many hours of use. It's got a hopper that you can, uh, either get rid of or recycle what, you know, once your, once your, uh, blast medium is basically contaminated enough, then you need to change it out but otherwise you just recycle it. And uh, so, yeah, and you need a compressor, obviously, that can handle 90 PSI. So, okay, so essentially this is just shoots out a bunch of little tiny particles and those abrasive particles smooth out your object and you can control that by that gun that you just showed. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like sanding, if you will, but it's just, it's just shooting out it's like sandblasting. That's what it is. It's a sand. This is a sandblasting cabinet. They call it a blast cabinet though, because now you don't have to use sand. You can use a lot of people use glass, charcoal. Wall, there's even a walnut husks you can uh, use. Just depending on which abrasiveness, whatever you're trying to tackle. Um, yeah, the they use these a lot in auto shops for um, blasting off like rusty parts that they're going to paint. You know, before you paint it, you got to blast the rust off. So. This is an easier way to get into those nooks and crannies. So if you're looking for a way to kind of sandblast a part, kind of uh, clean a part, uh, blast cabinet's definitely the way to go. Right, that's 
man, you always come up with great things, Chris. <laughs> so you, you have one on order? You're going to have it soon? Yeah. Yeah. So I have one of that, that same, that same one that I just showed, I ordered one of those. Yeah. Because I have some parts for clients that I've been sending out and they're like, well, these are really good SLA parts. Um, but they have the dimpling and they would prefer to pay me to post process them so that when they get it, it's like a finished, you know, it's all finished Add painting options. I mean, essentially I've turned into kind of like a model maker, not just a 3d printer. So, well, and, and I'm going to say that that's what I, I spend most of my time, e even though I do a lot of shapeways, but I always get the unfinished parts and I do all my own finishing because it just takes too long to get finished parts for them. Um, and then obviously with my, both my SLA and my FDM, I have the same issues and you spend a lot of time filing and sanding. So I've got all types of files and sandpapers and these blocks and then different paints and coatings. And, uh, yeah, I should have thought of that. So I don't know. I'll see how it works out for you. Sure. I noticed that one of the materials you had actually was like little pastel, excuse me, plastic granules. So that could be cool because I would think the other items might be too abrasive with some of the softer resins or plastics. And that, uh, that sounds really neat. So yeah, and according to right on uh, Stratus's website, they uh, they have a bead blasting uh, section that just talks about finishing processes. Um, obviously, they've got a. Uh, I've experimented with a lot of these finishing options, but this is the first time I'm getting into bead blasting. Um, and this is what a lot of those people that make finished parts out there, that's what they're doing. Um, and then this kind of gives you an overview of uh, the material that they're recommending is a, uh, a poly plus and they rec with a recommended hardness rating and sieve size and all that. So they've got the specs right there on stratasys.com cool. and you can find out more just by doing a little research. Well, Chris, hopefully when you get it in, maybe you can give us a little tutorial on the next show. Uh, I'd love to see it in use and see the difference in prices. Yeah. And prices in parts, because, you know, as you know, I go to you for parts as well, especially when I need quick turnaround and, uh, you know, I actually have to spend some time finishing. And so I'd really like to see, you know, obviously I'm assuming you'll have a finishing cost that'll go along with it. I did that, but uh, uh, yeah, very cool, Chris. Thank you very much. Well, you know, I was going to talk about what's in the news as far as shows coming up, but there only seems to be something and that's at the end of the month. And that is in Dusseldorf, which, you know, if you're from Germany and you're watching the show, cool for you. But other than that, um, uh, Nothing I've got really. two next week. I've got two next week. So, okay. and one of the ones that, uh, one of the news items that we didn't really cover uh, today, but maybe we'll cover. Did we miss one? We missed one. And it's. Oh, the, that was the 3D in medicine, wasn't it? Uh, no. Well, this one oh, is Mark Forged unveiled their Mark II industrial strength 3D printer. Uh, prints faster. Uh, you can print smaller parts. Um, so I got on the horn to these guys just to find out more and they're going to be demoing this machine at a show called Aerodef. Aerodef. And this is going to be happening. Um, this is an aerospace defense, uh, manufacturing and composites manufacturing show going on next week from February 8th to 10th in Long Beach. Hmm. And then we've also got the Pacific design. And manufacturing show coming up as well at about the same time and that's going on in anaheim same dates i believe or it's the 9th through the 11th and it shares uh so this is westpac and design and manufacturing pacific show uh this is a really good show for people that are like to geek out on robotics and uh Really good show. Highly recommend it. Stuff. This is where all the people come that like Chinese companies come, the companies that are making stuff from prototype to actually manufacturing, whether it's assembling or they sell assembly equipment. Um, it's kind of a really great show. So uh, I'm planning to attend. Go? Yeah, I'm planning to attend uh, one or two days here and then head over to the AeroDef, check out, uh, check out some of the um, the Mark, the Mark II printer, uh, sometime next week. Well, Chris, I would really love, you've got your phone. I would really love to do a hangout with you. You just point your camera at it 
and put your earbuds in and give us a little commentary. I'd really appreciate that. Okay, okay, okay. So I could I could work on that. I know I have some meetings, obviously. Um, you know, it's it's pretty all business when I when I go to a show, but I'll uh, I'll try and uh, maybe do a little uh, find some little nuggets and then revisit them and and uh, maybe do a little hangout. I'd really appreciate that. And I think our audience would as well. So yes, please. Uh, I would love that, uh, especially that uh, manufacturing show. And you know, Chris, I was looking through the show notes and that wasn't in there. So yes, I do think we need to revisit it. Um, the pricing looked pretty good. Uh, and I think I've seen them. I think they had a booth at, uh, when I was at uh, MedX. So obviously, uh, from what I saw, it's a very durable, um, high, not necessarily high performing, but the high repeatability and reliability, which is obviously extremely important if you want to get into this business. Okay. Well, I think that's about it, Chris. What do you think? Now, I think we it's... didn't cover anything in medicine. You did have an item there, but I guess we can just throw it off to the next week. Yeah, we could pick it up next week. Okay. Well, Chris, thank you again for being yeah, here. Yeah, a really good time uh, talking to Gabriel from uh, New Pro 3D. Really excited to see what they come up with, um, you know, and, and get out to the public. It looks really exciting. Okay. On that note, right. we'll see you next week on another episode of All Things 3D. Bye.